I think the purpose of these series of home retreats is to bring to the home the advice and guidance of the rule of Benedict. I've called this one Brothers and Sisters, St Benedict's concept of family life, because the concept of family life is at the root of Benedictine life. Monastic life began with solitary hermits in the Egyptian desert. Monachos, the Greek word, means a solitary and comes into English as monk. Then St. Cassian, who'd been a soldier, organised the solitary monks into some sort of groups. But I think the first rule in which family life is really important is Benedict's rule for monks. The principal idea is that the brothers should help one another, both in daily life and on their way to God. The abbot, of course, is the father and must be treated with the respect due to a father. Always in this family, it must be remembered that it is a sacred family, just as the church is a sacred family, in which all are striving together to seek God. So when the abbot is called Abba, the word being used is the word which Jesus used to address his father in his most intimate and agonised of his prayers in Gethsemane. Much more than this, the abbot must care for his sons with the care of a father, indeed with the care of the heavenly father. Again and again in the rule, brotherhood and family become obvious. At the door should be an old monk, ready to receive guests, and too immobile to wander off. So he should have a helper who complements his inability by running errands for him. The bursar, if the community is rather large, says St Benedict, should have a helper to lighten his tasks. The brothers should respect the seniors and love the juniors. They need to behave always with respect for others. So in a world where even private prayer was normally vocal, or at any rate murmured, perhaps under one's breath, just as at that time people normally read aloud, not quietly, during private prayer in the oratory, each must be careful not to disturb others by praying too loud. In other ways, Benedict is careful to show that all the monks should be regarded as equal members of the family. Even the most junior has an equal say in the discussions of the chapter. Perhaps the strongest provision of all is that of serving one another in the refectory. Benedict stresses most strongly that all must undertake this service except the abbot and the bursar, who obviously serve the community plentifully in other ways. Benedict is perfectly aware of human failings. So when the monks have a long period of reading on a Sunday, a senior monk should wander around as they sit in the cloister to ensure that they are really reading, not idly chatting. This is the part played by a senior monk, senior member of the family. The beds of the juniors should not be together, but the juniors sh should be scattered around lest they get up to hijinks at night. When the monks get up at an uncomfortable hour of the morning, they should gently encourage one another to get down to the church on time. To my mind, the most solicitous of all cares laid upon the superior is about delinquents. If a member of the community has to be punished by isolation, the superior must quietly send in to him mature and steady members of the community, in case he's confused and upset, and to show that he really is still loved. This shows to me the real delicacy of a family and of a solicitor's father. That's all very well in a perfect world, but interpersonal relationships are always complicated. Even in a normal family, there can be quarrels and dissensions, how much more so in an artificial family, like a monastery, in which highly diverse people are brought together and into close contact over a long period. 
Before I became a monk, when I was only 17 years old, I came across a poem which has haunted me throughout my monastic life. It is The Soliloquy in a Spanish Cloister by Robert Browning, and I'd like to quote a few lines. It shows how things can go wrong in a monastic family. Grrr, there go my heart's abhorrence. What are your damned flowerpots do? If hate killed men, Brother Lawrence, God's blood would not mine kill you. What, your myrtle bush needs trimming? Oh, that rose has prior claims. Need its leaden vase filled brimming. Hell dry you up with its flames. At the meal we sit together, a salve tibi, I must hear. Wise talk of the kind of weather, sort of season, time of year. Uh, not, not a plenteous cork crop. Scarcely dare we hope oak galls, I doubt. Uh, what's the Latin name for parsley? What's the Greek name for swine's snout? Phew! We'll have our platter burnished, laid with care on our own shelf. And so on. It brings home the reality of envenomed hatred. It's so easy and so destructive to hate in any human group, any human family or business or more casual situation. But the closer knit the group is, the more destructive is the hatred. Look at another family, the family which we, family which we meet in church. There, too, hostile criticism is easy enough. Ha! Huh, typical! She always shows off by the hat she wears. Or, ha! Huh, he reads as though he were addressing a board meeting. Or addressing a children's party. You can take a choice. It's particularly dangerous if the monk is a school teacher who's trained to spot faults and correct them. Perhaps that's why the letter of James says you should not all be teachers. That's why the corruption of family life expressed in that soliloquy in the Spanish cloister has been an uncomfortable spectre for me throughout my monastic life. Correction is particularly dangerous and we all have plenty of little ways and habits which do need corrections. Benedict ends his rule with a chapter on good and even evil zeal. It's only recently that I've come to realise what is meant by an evil zeal. Isn't all zeal always a good thing? Benedict uses it in a special, technical and biblical sense, and that's what I've realised. In the Bible, zeal is an eagerness for the law, championship of the law. It often comes to mean an intervention to ensure that the law is being observed. One occasion is when a zealous Israelite pierces through with a single spear a couple, an Israelite man and a non-Israelite woman, who are having sexual relationships against the law. He ensures that the Israelite observes the law. So I conceive good and even ze evil zeal like this. Good zeal is a genuine assistance to others to observe the law, sparked by genuine love of that person. On the other hand, evil zeal is the criticism sparked by mere spite, envy, jealousy, dislike, which points out failures in another and in fact rejoices in them. It's so easy, especially in an enclosed community like a monastery or a family, to observe faults of behaviour, to store them up and allow them to fester. That's what we see in the friar in the Spanish cloister. So what is Benedict's remedy? The Lord's Prayer and his petition for forgiveness on the condition of forgiving others. The abbot solemnly and publicly speaks the prayer on our behalf at Lord's and Vespers, the beginning and the end of the day. We seek forgiveness 
only on condition that we forgive others. Can we join in this and still allow the faults to fester? When we live in any sort of family or community, there are bound to be moments or ways in which we upset one another, provoke one another's jealousy or rivalry. Matthew the Evangelist knows this well, for in his discourse on relationships with the, within the community, he devotes almost half of the chapter 18 to a process of reconciliation after disagreement or a quarrel, and this leads on to the final clause, on to the daunting parable of the unforgiving debtor. That's also the importance of the daily shared Eucharist, it seems to me. Can we stand together and approach the altar to receive the Lord while still allowing the envy, jealousy, hatred, criticism to foster within us? The Eucharist is the prequel, the prequel of the Passion of Christ. When Jesus offers himself to his disciples in the moment of wiping away the disobedience of the world and of the human race. His death is the moment of perfect love for his Father by his perfect loving obedience. He is there as love made perfect. Can we come to receive the body and blood of the Lord while still harbouring within us such spite and resentments? Does the Lord want to be received day after day, by someone turmoiled by hostility and jealousy. For me, this is the importance of the daily monastic Eucharist. St Paul tells us so clearly that we cannot partake of the Eucharist and remain a divided and fractious community. Real family life denotes loving care for the welfare of others. Interpersonal relationships are the basis of family life, and that's why Benedict brings his rule to a final climax by the contrast of the good and evil zeal. It suggested that I might suggest various ways in which we follow this out on this day of retreat. One. Show your love to other members of your family, remembering especially that tomorrow is Father's Day. A few telephone calls, perhaps? Two. Is there anyone you have not forgiven? Show it now in such a way that the bond is strengthened to something more than it was before the offence. Three. Is there anyone who needs to forgive you? Give that person a chance to forgive you in a delicate way. Four. Is there any way in which I could play a more helpful part in my family, my district, my office life, my relationship with colleagues? Five. Read chapter 72 of the rule on good and evil zeal. 6. Read Browning's soliloquy in the Spanish cloister. It's online. Does it sound a chord in your life? Is there anyone in your life to whom you feel like this? 7. Pay a visit, perhaps a virtual visit, to a lonely person who lacks family. And you're especially welcome to join us at 8.15 for Compline this evening. And may we have a happy and fruitful retreat this day.